Thank you. Warmest of welcomes this morning. As you can probably tell, I'm a bit bunged up, so we're looking to the Lord to really help us. But it's great to be here, and it's great to worship God, isn't it, on his day. As we come to worship the Lord, his word says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first hymn, number 16. Number 16, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days. Number 16. pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you that you are immortal. We thank you that you have never had a beginning and you will never have an end from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. We bow before you. We cannot see you, O oh God. You are invisible to our eyes. We know that no representation that any man can have of you is right. We should not make any graven image of you, any carved image. You are spirit, O oh God, and you are invisible to our eyes. Indeed, if you were to reveal your glory to us, we would not be able to cope. You are the God who is only wise. We thank you that you have all wisdom. 
Thank you that in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We bless you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wise Saviour. And we thank you that when we are in Christ, he becomes our wisdom. We bless you that he is our wisdom and he is our understanding. And oh, Father, we bow before you, the great God, your truly dwell in unapproachable light. Your presence is glorious. We thank you that the angels bow in your presence, O oh God. And we ask that we would truly grasp something of your grandeur, something of your greatness. You are great and you are glorious and you are the Lord God Almighty. You are the Ancient of Days and so is your Son, O oh God. And we worship you even though we have not really scratched the surface of who you are. But yet we thank you that what we know of you, we know of you really and truly, that what you have revealed yourself to be in Scripture, in your word, is true. We thank you, O Lord, that you have shown us what you are like. We thank you that your, your word reveals your character. It reveals your characteristics. We thank you that you are love. We thank you that you are justice, that your justice is high soaring above like mountains that tower over us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your grace and your goodness. We thank you that you are described in your word as love. God is love. We thank you that you are light. We thank you that you are true. And we thank you that you are beyond us. And you are the creator. And we are your creatures. And we pray as we bow in your presence this morning that we would humbly worship you. That we would bow, O oh God, cheerfully and prayerfully. Speak to us in this time of worship as we open your word again in a few moments and as we read its contents and as we have ministry from your word. We pray that it would help our hearts. We ask that you would speak to us by your spirit. And that you would truly presence yourself with us. Oh Lord, we pray that you would do us good by being here today. Watch over us then, because we need you. We know that unless you build the house, they labor in vain who build it. And therefore we pray that you would build us up in our most holy faith. That you would really work, because we pray it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open our Bibles and we turn to two readings. First of all, there is the book of Genesis, chapter 50. The book of Genesis, chapter 50. And we're going to read verse 22 to the end of the chapter. That's on page 50. And then we're going to read Joshua, chapter 24, verse 29 to 33. And that's on page 216. I can repeat that later. But first of all then, there's Genesis chapter 50, reading from verse 22. Page 50 in the church Bible. Genesis chapter 50, reading from verse 22. Let's hear God's word. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt... He and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Micah, the son of Manasseh, who were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt." 
and then Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, and we're reading from verse 29 to the end of the book, and it's on page 216. Joshua chapter 24, reading from verse 29. Now it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath, Sirah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gaash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem, in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for one hundred pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eleazar the son of Aaron died. They buried him in a hill belonging to Phinehas his son, which was given to him in the mountains of Ephraim. We sing our second hymn, number 105. Number 105, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Number 100. And five. Thank you. 
Great. Well, we're continuing with Big Bible Stories, and we've been looking at Abraham. And God had promised Abraham that he would have a son. But there was a problem. He was getting old, and old people don't have children. And so was Sarah. She was getting old as well. Not much chance of having a child. But God said that Sarah would have a child. Abraham was a father of Ishmael with Hagar, Sarah's maid. maid, But that wasn't going to be the promised son. And the Lord came to Abraham and said, it's through Sarah. And he laughed. And the Lord said, you're going to have a son. And here's his name. He's called Isaac. And Isaac means laughter because Abraham laughed and as we'll see in a minute Sarah laughed as well he was given the name Isaac now there was somebody else who was given the name from God more important than Isaac who is it Jesus he was given the name when he was conceived when he was in Mary's womb To Joseph, the angel gave his name to Joseph. You'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, one day Abraham was sitting in his tent. Presumably his awning was giving him some shade in the heat of the day, like today, at midday when the sun gets up. And there were three people that came and they were angels. And one of them was the Lord Jesus. And they confirmed this time next year, you're going to have a child with Sarah. Now, do you know, there's always somebody listening in, isn't there? Do you ever do that? Do you ever earwig? Do you ever listen in to a conversation from mummy and daddy are having and you're listening? Well, Sarah was in the tent while the Lord was telling Abraham, you're going to have a child and she's listening in. And when she heard that, she laughed. Oh, how am I going to have a child? I'm so old. And the Lord said, why did you laugh, Sarah? And she said, I didn't laugh. She lied. But the Lord said, no, but you did laugh. Because the Lord sees us. Even when anybody else doesn't see us, the Lord sees you. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you say. He knows what you do. And we can't hide anything from God. Everything is naked and bare to God, to whom we must give an account. And what they had to do, Abraham and Sarah, was trust in the promises of God. And that's what we're to do. However unlikely it sounds, we're to trust in the Lord. Are you trusting in the Lord? Let's come to our time of prayer. We're going to pray for Grace Baptist Partnership. It was lovely to have Barry on Wednesday. He's working in Wimbledon. So we're going to pray for his work in Wimbledon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your purposes. Lord, we really do know that truism of those words that we've sung that you move in a mysterious way you don't do what we think you will do but lord we thank you that your wonders are to be performed you plant your footsteps in the sea and you ride upon the storm lord you work in difficulties Just like the difficulties of Abraham and Sarah being past the age of childbearing. And yet you promised them a son and you performed that. We thank you that deep in unfathomable minds is your never failing skill. We can never get to the bottom of it. We're like in a maze that we get lost. In a labyrinth of your greatness. We can't fathom it out. We can't work it out, Lord. Your ways are past finding out. But we pray that however hard it is for us, that we would trust in you. And even though we can't trace you, we pray that we would trust you. We praise you for Barry. We pray for him. We thank you for him coming to us on Wednesday. We pray for his work for you in Wimbledon. And we ask that you would greatly bless him there as he seeks to plant that church for you. We ask, O Lord, that you would send them encouragements. Even today, we pray for that fellowship, that you would be near to them and give them grace and help. We pray for Grace Baptist Partnership. We pray that you would be with us. Help us, O Lord, as we assimilate and pray over the things that you shared with us. We pray that you would be with us as a fellowship. Lead us, Lord. Give us your wisdom, for we have none of our own. 
Lord, if we ever think we've got it sewn up, Lord, we've not. Lord, if anyone thinks we're anything, Lord, we're nothing. Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts. You would lead us. We pray that you would come behind us with that voice that says, this is the way. Walk in it. Lord, give us that guidance from you individually in our lives and corporately. We pray for any among us this morning that are struggling for various reasons. You know everything. We thank you that you, O oh God, work your purposes out. And we pray that you would be near to those in particular need today. We pray for the preaching of your word. We ask that it would take root in our hearts. We pray that we would learn of the faith of a saint of old. And that we would really be blessed and benefit from your word. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Hear us because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 852, a prayer for us. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. 8852, 852. Thank you.
In our ministry this morning, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. So if you would like to open your Bibles there to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22, as we continue our studies through this wonderful chapter in the Word of God. And it says, By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. So we've arrived at the stage where we're looking at the life and faith of Joseph, a very important man in the word of God. He had tremendous faith. And as we look at this verse particularly, and as we look at Joseph generally, we've got four key words. Number one, we're going to look at introduction, an introduction to Joseph's life. Meet Joseph. He was a good man. I don't know what you know about the life of Joseph. There's introduction. Then secondly, we're going to see mention because we're told in our verse that when he was dying, made mention of the departure or the exodus of the children of Israel. Thirdly, we're going to see instruction because he gave instruction concerning his bones. There at the end of verse 22, And fourthly, we're going to see implementation. Was what Joseph desired implemented? Did it actually happen? So first of all then, notice with me, there is introduction. Introduction. What do you know about the life of Joseph? You may have seen those films, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat and all the rest. I was speaking to a man in the week who lives a few doors away from me. He said, what are you preaching on Sunday? So I said, Joseph... And we said, oh, you're going to mention Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat and all the rest of it. But Joseph, you may know about that, but he's a very important man in the word of God. You can read his story in quite a lot of depth from Genesis chapter 37 onwards. Joseph's father was Jacob. And Jacob was a godly man, very godly man. In fact, in the word of God, the Lord describes himself as the God of Jacob. But he was a godly man, but he wasn't a perfect man. He was like us. He was faulty. And one of his faults was that he favoured one of his sons more than the other sons that he had. He had quite a few sons. And he favoured Joseph. And he, and he put this inordinate affection upon Joseph. And he gave him this wonderful tunic of many colours, this wonderful robe. Well, what's that going to do? To the rest of the family. You know that when a person in a family is singled out, that raises envy among siblings, doesn't it? And Joseph is singled out for the especial care of his father, and that raises huge issues among his brothers. They hated him, so much so that one day when Jacob sent Joseph off to give some food to his brothers, that they threw him in a pit, And they ate the food that he gave them. And as they were eating, there were some Egyptian travellers that were coming by. And they got Joseph out of the pit and sold him off as a slave to Egypt. They killed a kid of the goat. And they put this wonderful tunic in the blood, showed it to their father, told him a pack of lies. And his father thought that Joseph was no more. And that he had died when all the while he was being packed off, carted off to Egypt. And when he was in Egypt, he was a slave of the captain of the guard called Potiphar. Well, things went well for a while in one sense because Joseph, he's a godly man and he didn't sulk. He's away from his family. He's away from his country. He could have sulked. He could have had a temper tantrum. He could have said, I'm not going to do anything. But he didn't do that at all. He loved the Lord and Joseph's life's remarkable when you consider the disadvantages that Joseph had. He didn't have a Bible like we have. He didn't have a local church like we do that can go there and meet with other believers, did he? Who loved the Lord in Egypt except for Joseph? But yet he maintained his godliness and he loved the Lord and it was a wonderful life. He was tempted to commit immorality, but he repulsed, he refused that temptation, and he was blamed for something that he didn't even do. He was put into prison, but again, he didn't sulk. And we're told that the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that a lovely statement when you read Joseph's life? 
that it says the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord is with his people. And you may go through times in your life when you're saying, what's happening here? Just like Joseph. Imagine him thinking when he was being carted off into Egypt, what's happening? And then, had salt into the wounds, he's now a prisoner for something that he didn't even commit. And eventually, he rose up in the prison. Wonderful man there, he worked. And he interpreted the dream of the butler and of the baker. Chief butler and chief baker of, of Pharaoh interpreted that dream rightly. The butler was restored to his position, but the baker was sadly hanged. And he said, remember me when, you, when you're restored. And he forgot him. How do you know how Joseph felt after that? But one day, Pharaoh had a dream, and he dreamt this dream, didn't know what it meant. And someone said, ah, we know a man who can help you. And so the butler told Pharaoh about Joseph, and Joseph was taken from prison, and he was able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh that there would be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And their recommendation was, you need to choose a man who's going to store up, who's going to manage the seven years of plenty to store away food for the seven years of famine. Pharaoh said, well, what better man than you? You are the man. And he was prime minister. Imagine that. One down from Pharaoh. He went from prison to prime minister. Just like that. And the Lord was with him. And many things happened in between. But eventually Jacob and Joseph's brothers came to live in Egypt. And they settled down. And we're told about Joseph's life, something at the end of his life. This wonderful godly life. When he was dying. But the thing about Joseph is that he was a type, a picture of the Lord Jesus. Now maybe if we were to go into your home, maybe on the mantelpiece, or maybe up on the wall, a bit like sometimes the rose gallery, there is pictures of your loved ones, of your family. Now they are not your family, but they're pictures of your family. And Joseph is not Jesus, but he's a picture of Jesus. Just as a photo of your family is a picture of them, but it's not them, Joseph is a picture of Jesus Christ. You say, well, how is he a picture of Jesus Christ? He was hated by his family. Well, isn't that what the Lord Jesus was when he came to this world? In John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. He came to the Jewish people, his own kith and kin. And what did they do with the Lord Jesus? Even though they've got all of the Old Testament, they rejected him. You would have thought that they would have welcomed him in with open arms. But they didn't. They rejected him. He suffered for crimes he didn't commit. And isn't that like the Lord Jesus upon the cross of Calvary? Jesus wasn't on the cross because of any wrong things that he had done. Because of any sins that he had committed. Not at all. He was there for crimes that others had done. And in the same way as Joseph was punished for things he didn't do, the Lord Jesus was punished on the cross for what he didn't do, for sins that others had committed. And when we trust in him, our sins are forgiven. When we trust in Christ, we're pardoned and we're right with God. Joseph is a picture. He's like a shadow. You know when you walk around and the sun goes on it and the light goes on and there's a shadow of you? Well, Joseph is a shadow. He's a picture. He's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to get beyond the gate of Joseph and we're to consider the Lord Jesus. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ? We're to look to the Saviour and to believe in Christ. Are we trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? So here, out of all of the events that the writer could have chosen about the life of Joseph... All his attitude when he was sold into Egypt, his, his wonderful demeanour of when he was in prison, his attitude toward Pharaoh, his godliness toward his father, the godliness when his father died toward his brothers, when he said that God meant it for good even though they had meant it for evil. All of those things are bypassed in Hebrews 11, even though they clearly show Jacob's, Joseph's faith. And he's told about the end. 
of his life. That's interesting, isn't it? All throughout Joseph's life, he had faith. Have we got faith? You see, in order to have dying faith, we need to have living faith. Faith doesn't always just switch itself on. It's not just that, well, you know, as soon as you become near the end, then suddenly you're going to have faith. Like a light switch, you just turn it on. Just like a power button on a computer, and then it just lights up. It doesn't work like that, does it? Not really. In fact, lots of people die as they live, sadly. If we want dying faith, we've got to have living faith. You remember the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 20. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Joseph had living faith with all those disadvantages that Joseph had. No Bible, no family, away from his his, his home environment. The Lord was not loved. He was in a pagan environment where they worship all kinds of other gods. They worship the not, which is why the plagues was an, a, was an assault on their gods because they worship the Nile, they worship the moon, they worship the animals, and all the other gods. They were idol worshippers. And Joseph, in the midst of that awful environment, that pagan environment, shone. He was soul and he was light. And we live in a decaying society. We live in a pagan environment. The vast majority of people couldn't care. Tuttons that Jesus died on a cross. And we are to be salt, which is a preservative. Because in Bible times, when they didn't have fridges, what they would do is use salt to preserve food. So they stop it going off in the heat. And we are to be salt. If we trust in Christ, we're to be salt in the situation the Lord has placed us in. Just as Joseph was salt in the situation that God had placed him. And he was a light in the midst of that dark environment where the true God was not honoured. Joseph shone as a great light. Whether he was in Potiphar, and Potiphar could trust him before he was falsely accused by by Potiphar's wife. He was a shining light when he was in prison. He was a shining light when he was prime minister. He was a national hero. He saved Egypt from starvation. Incredible life. Joseph lived. He was salt and light. Have we got living faith? Are we salt and light in the midst of a decaying society where right is called wrong and wrong is called right? We are to be like Joseph. How relevant the scriptures are. How wonderfully relevant Joseph in the midst of a pagan environment shone brightly for the Lord. Are we doing that? Shine brightly for the Lord. And here is Joseph and he's at the end of his life. He lived 110 years, long life, wasn't it? in, In terms of our way of thinking. And Joseph's dying. He's on his deathbed. And he's got dying. When that moment comes, and we don't know when it's going to come, but if we know that it is going to come soon, what's going to support you when you die? You see, for Joseph, it wasn't the fact that he had done a good job in Egypt. You know, I look back, I've had a reward in life. No, is that he loved God. It was that the Lord was his Lord. That's what supported Joseph when he died. What's going to support you when you come to death? We can be assured of glory itself when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph had living faith and he had dying faith. Here's an introduction to Joseph's life. Read about him in Genesis. It's a wonderful life that he lived. Introduction. Then secondly, we see mention. Because we're told, aren't we, by the writer of the Hebrews, as he talks about Joseph, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying. He's writing because these people that he was writing to, the writer of the Hebrews, had need of endurance and they needed persevering faith. And we need persevering faith right to the end, which is why in three consecutive verses, they talk about people's dying faith. The dying faith of Isaac, verse 20. The dying faith of Jacob, verse 21 and the dying faith of Joseph, verse 22. And we need to persevere. We've got to keep going to the end, just like the athlete. And they run round so many tracks, on the track, so many rounds, and then when the bell goes for the last lap, have you ever noticed this? They run really fast. It's not that they weren't slacking before, they weren't. But it's, they run really fast 
in the final throws. And when we see the end coming, are we going to run really fast? Because that's what Isaac and Jacob and Joseph did. They were really bright at the end. And is that what we're going to be like? And Joseph, as he's there on his deathbed, he made mention of the departure of the children of Israel. Characteristic of Joseph. He's a good, pious man. Why? Because he's not thinking firstly about himself when he dies, is he? He doesn't first of all mention about his bones. He first of all mentions about the Lord's people. What's going to happen to the people of God? That's his first consideration. It's not what am I about me? How am I going to get on? Look after number one. That was not Joseph. Joseph's priority was first of all when he was dying to make mention of the departure of the children of Israel. He wasn't selfish, was Joseph. He looked out for the Lord's people. He wanted to know the future of the Lord's people. He wanted to encourage them as he was there on his deathbed that the future was bright, that this was a temporary arrangement for them living in Egypt. It wasn't going to be permanent. He made mention. That word made mention, it can also mean to remind them. He reminded them. Don't forget the promises of God. And Joseph would have known about the promises of God because his great-grandfather Abraham one day had a dream. The Lord caused Abraham to be in a deep sleep and the Lord told Abraham that the people of God would go into a land that was not their own and that they would be afflicted and that God would judge this nation whom they serve and that they would come out. But it wouldn't happen yet because the sins of the Amorites were not yet complete. And there, the Lord prophesied to Abraham concerning the future of the children of Israel. And Joseph would have known that. And so he, he, he works on this. As he talks about the fact that they're going to be a departure or an exodus out of Egypt for the children of Israel. The, Joseph believed the word of God. He believed what the Lord had said to his great grandpa. Even though there was all those years in Egypt. All those years when he didn't have access to his godly family telling him. You would have thought it would have blunted his faith. You would have thought it would have taken the edge off of Joseph's faith in God. But it didn't. We can so easily, can't we, be desensitized by the sin around us. We can so easily be influenced by the spirit of our age. We can so easily not be shocked anymore at sin. But Joseph didn't do that, did he? He had strong faith. And we're to be those who have strong faith. Sometimes our faith gets weak and we need others to strengthen our faith. It's just like in the Pilgrim's Progress when Christian was passing over that river and hopeful. He gives him despair in his faith because his, his faith was, was dim as he was going over that river and he thought the river was deep. And sometimes we need others to help us to, to stir us on in our faith that we would press on, that we'd have strong faith. And Joseph has strong faith as he mentions the departure of the children of Israel. And you know, Joseph did mention the departure of the children of Israel, which is what we read in Genesis chapter 50, verse 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I'm dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. What faith? He still believed in the promises of his great-grandfather Abraham of his grandfather Isaac, of his father Jacob, even though he had spent nearly a hundred years in Egypt, he still believed at the end the promises of God. And how we shouldn't be those who let the world wag our tails. How we shouldn't be those who let the world set our agendas. Joseph loved the Lord and he had faith in God and he did make mention of the departure of the children of Israel and he said, God will surely. It's not a maybe. It's not there's a good chance he's going to do it. No. Joseph's faith is like the midday sun. There's no cloud over it. He says, God will surely do it. He's going to surely visit you. Now, we look back and we know that the Lord did. 
We know that after the book of Genesis is the book of Exodus. And we know that the Lord did visit the children of Israel. He did send those plagues. And he did cause the children of Israel to exit Egypt. And Joseph's faith is not unfounded, is it? It's absolutely on cue, is, is his faith, isn't it? It's strong. Do we really believe that what the Lord has said will happen? Do we really believe that? It's a strong faith that he has. It's going to happen. God is going to visit you, children of Israel, and you're going to come out of Egypt, and you're going to go to the land of Canaan, as the Lord has promised. To that land flowing with milk and honey and all the promises of God that are yes and in Christ they are, amen. They're absolutely true and we know they're true. Look at the ultimate promise in the Old Testament. All throughout the Old Testament, we can summarize the Old Testament with three words. He is coming. Christ is on his way and he came. Do you ever order things online on Amazon or something like that on some other website and you order this particular product, and, and they send you multiple messages on your emails or on your phone. Do you, do you know that? And they say, well, it's been picked from the shelves. And then you might get another message to say, well, it's on the courier. And then you might get another message to say it's in a local depot. And then you might get another message to say, well, it's coming tomorrow between 10 and 12. And what are they saying? They're saying it's on its way. It's on its way. It's on its way. And throughout the Old Testament, the Lord is saying, my son is on his way. He's coming. And just as the parcel comes, the Lord Jesus actually came. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. At the right time, the Lord Jesus came. He always keeps his promises. He doesn't always do it in the way we want him to do it, but he always keeps it. However unlikely it may seem, however scientifically impossible, because God doesn't always work scientifically. Don't limit God with science. As if science is the answer, it hasn't. Because God's above that. He can do what he wants, can the Lord. And he keeps his promises. He kept his promise to Abraham. He kept his promise to Isaac and Jacob. He kept his promise to the children of Israel that they would leave Egypt. Even though it would have been so unlikely when they're feeling the whips on their back from that hard taskmaster Pharaoh, from that tyrant, yet they still believed the promises of God. And we should do we? Always believe them. And we should not be those who are just so caught up with ourselves. Oh, it doesn't matter, does it? As long as I'm okay. Joseph didn't do that. No. What's the future for the children of Israel? And he made mention of their departure. There is mention. The promises of God truly are yes and in Christ. Amen. And when he promises that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, he is absolutely right. That when you call on the name of the Lord, these show us, these lesser promises, if you like, point to that ultimate promise, that gospel promise, that whoever calls on his name will be saved. He's promised you that. Call upon him while you can. While there's opportunity, call upon him in the Lord Jesus. So we've seen, first of all, there is introduction. Secondly, there's mention. Thirdly, there's instruction. Here, again, look at our verse. It says, By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. Now, what's all this about? You might think this is all a bit weird. I mean, why is Joseph giving instruction about his bones? And I mean, why are we looking at all of this? Well, this is deeply relevant, by the way. He did give instruction concerning his bones. Again, in Genesis chapter 50, right at the end, which we read earlier on, <clears throat> we're told, verse 25 of Genesis 50, then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Isn't it amazing that the scriptures, they dovetail together? Here, Genesis 50, hundreds of years before the writer of Hebrews, he says, right, 
Joseph makes mention of his bones. What do we find in Hebrews 11? Joseph making mention of his bones. It marries together. It dovetails together. Does the Bible. Incredible. And Joseph did. He made mention of his bones. You're going to carry up my bones from here. Now that word instruction is rightly translated instruction, but it's quite strong. It's not so much a teacher imparting instruction to pupils. It's more of a sergeant giving instructions to a private. In fact, the AV translates as command, which is a good translation. It's okay to say instruction. It's not the normal word for command, but it, but it is a command. It does come across with that sort of force and emphasis. You see, Joseph didn't sit the children of Israel down and say, listen, would you mind awfully, when I die, just taking me bones up out of Egypt, when you have the exodus, if you wouldn't mind doing that, and just bury them when you get to Canaan, if you get round to it, would you mind awfully? There's not a bit of it, is there? He binds them in a strong oath. The Hebrew word for oath is to bind themselves. He binds the children of Israel, the Israelites, and that binding was to Israelites as a whole, to successive generations. So it wasn't just to those that were living. He was binding all the nation of Israel, and he was saying, right, you bury my bones, not in Egypt, but in Canaan. Now, this was incredible. Why was this incredible? It was incredible because you could forgive Joseph saying, well, I've been living in Egypt now for nearly 100 years. And, well, you know, I've been so influential. Well, I should really have a plot in, in Egypt, shouldn't I? You know, I mean, who cares about that? But he didn't do that. And the reason why he wanted to be buried in Canaan was not for a sentimental reason. It was for a spiritual reason. It was not, well, wouldn't it be nice to be buried near Dad? That's people do, and that's okay. But, but Joseph, it was more than that. It was far more than that. He was saying, I believe the promises of God. He was saying, as public expression of his faith in the Lord... Look, I can't get to Canaan physically because I'm going to die, but I'm going to get to Canaan symbolically by my bones. The Lord is going to take you out of Egypt. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I believe that promise with all my heart, even though I'm not going to see it in my lifetime. And you're going to leave Egypt and you're going to get to Canaan and you're going to take my bones out of Egypt because I don't want to be classed as a posterity of Egypt. So that when people look on, an illustrious tomb would have been available for, for Joseph, wouldn't it? I mean, he was a prime minister. I mean, how many prime ministers do you see that have a pauper's grave? Yeah, not many. He's an affluent country, was Egypt. He was regarded as a national hero. He would have had an illustrious tomb that would have been given to him, but he turned his back on all of that and said, I want to be buried in Canaan. Because I love the true God. And I don't want to be classed by posterity after me thinking, really, he was an Egyptian. I'm not an Egyptian. I belong to the Lord. What does Joseph do? He nails his colours to the mast. Even in his death, he's speaking. He's saying, I'm the Lord's. And I believe the promises that were given to my family. And what about us? Do we really look forward? You see, Joseph had faith that wasn't short-sighted. Do you have problems with your eyes? And probably none of us here have 20-20 vision, do we? Are you long-sighted or are you short-sighted? See, short-sighted, very good at looking at things from a short distance, but not very good at looking at things in a long distance. And it's the other way round when you're long-sighted. Very good at looking at things maybe from a long distance, not so good at looking at things nearby. I'm short-sighted. So I could read Bible here without my glasses easily. But if I took my glasses off, you'd be a haze now. But faith is not short-sighted. Joseph wasn't just being concerned to die nicely and, and in peace and comfort, and that was it. No, he wasn't short-sighted. He looked ahead. And that's what faith does. It looks ahead. It looks with an objective, with a purpose. He was Look into the children of Israel being in Canaan in the promised land. And are we looking ahead with our faith in an eternal perspective to know that this world is not all that there is and that we shouldn't be laying up treasures in earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
Friends, if we're just living for the here and now, we're to be pitied, aren't we? There is an eternity. Joseph looked to eternity. He looked to that, to that time in that Canaan, and we should be looking to that heavenly Canaan, to that time when we'll be forever with the Lord. Are you on your way? Are you going to glory? Do you look beyond this world to an eternity to face? It's not just about the here and it is about eternity with the Lord in glory. Is that where you're going? Is that where you're heading? Is that where you're marching? It was clear where Joseph's allegiance lie, wasn't it? You're going to take my bones. There's no if, buts and maybes. You're surely, you're going to put me under an oath. When I'm gone, children of Israel, you're going to bury me in Canaan. Get my bones out of Egypt. That's not where my heart is. Where's our heart? Is it in the Egypts of our world? Is it in the things of passing value and significance that we place so much emphasis on? Joseph's heart was with the Lord. And it was a spiritual reality. And how we should be as well. So in introduction, mention, instruction. Fourthly, implementation. Now, it's an important issue. Because not only is it in the word of God, it's repeated in the word of God, is Joseph's bones. Now the question is this, was Joseph's bones taken out of Egypt? Because he died for a long, long time before, when the exodus occurred, Moses was in charge, and finally, when they could go, and Pharaoh had said, right, finally go after the death of the firstborn, and by the way, Pharaoh's firstborn died as well, Pharaoh had had enough, you go before we all die. And when they died, we're told in Exodus chapter 13, verse 19, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Isn't that remarkable that Moses, when leaving Egypt, with so many things to think about, thousands of people to lead, as they were packing up, so many things to take with them, Moses didn't forget the oath that the children of Israel had bound themselves under, and as a leader of the children of Israel, it was his responsibility to make sure that oath was actually upheld, and Moses remembered, and he said, right, we need to get the bones of Joseph out of here, as he placed the nation under that oath. How far-sighted was Moses, wasn't he? Incredibly far-sighted. And are we like that? Sometimes we forget the things that we want to forget, don't we? But Moses didn't forget. And throughout all the wilderness wanderings of 40 years, in all those ups and downs of that period, and when Moses would, would die, he wouldn't go into the to the promised land because of unconfessed sin. Because of sin that he committed. I'm sure he confessed it, but he sinned. And him and Aaron couldn't go into the promised land because of their sin. Because he got angry. And Joshua took over when Moses died. And they went over the river Jordan. And they routed, they obliterated their enemies. And then the land was divvied up. And then we read at the end of Joshua something very interesting. Have you ever thought, why does Joshua end like Joshua ends? Have you got all these questions about the Bible? It's good, you know. It's good to ask lots of questions. And here we find, at the end of Joshua, this interesting statement. The children of Israel got rest from their enemies. They've divided up the land. There's peace for the children of Israel. And we're told in Joshua 24:32. The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamah, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver, and which he had become an inheritance of the children of Jacob. Do you know why it's mentioned there? And you might think, well, why is it mentioned about Eliezer dying and all of this? Because this actually highlights the main purpose of Joshua, which says that not one word failed of all the good things that the Lord had said. All came to pass. 
And this, at the end of Joshua, mentioning Joseph's bones, is actually fitting in with the main point of Joshua, because they're saying that the Lord's purposes always will out. And here's this proof of Joseph's faith, that there he was, he said, right, oath, take my bones up, bury me in Canaan, not in Egypt, and those bones safe all those 40 years and they buried them in the promised land in Shechem what a monument what a public expression to Joseph's faith wasn't it every time those families went by and they they saw maybe it was a plaque and they could see Joseph's bones are buried here what a testimony to that man's faith you know, when you see monuments around, maybe you see statues, you know, outside Westminster, there's a statue of Churchill. And there's all these different plaques, and this person did this here, or this person lived here, and it's a plaque, it's a monument to what they've done and who they are. And this is a monument to Joseph's faith. What a man he was, that he was godly. Are we like that? When we're dead and gone, what are people going to say about us? Are they going to say this was a person of faith? They loved the Lord. They served the Lord. They weren't perfect. Joseph wasn't perfect, but he served the Lord. Like Joshua, they said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And there, a testimony to his faith that he's buried. And not only is it a testimony to Joseph's faith and a monument and a spur to Joseph's faith as it is, but also, above and beyond that, far above and beyond that, doesn't the faith of Joseph say not only the faithfulness of Joseph, but the faithfulness of God in Joseph? How faithful the Lord had been to Joseph. In all the trials, the Lord was with Joseph. When he was there in, in Egypt, the Lord was with Joseph. When he was in prison, the Lord was with Joseph. When he's before Pharaoh, the Lord was with him there. And when he was them orchestrating all those seven years of plenty, storing up food. The Lord was with him there. And the Lord was with him right up to the end, including the right at the very end, with the oath that he made the children of Israel swear. It's a testimony of the faithfulness of God in Joseph. And when we look back over our lives, surely we should say, what a faithful God have I. What faithfulness the Lord has for us and how he has been good to us and how he has been kind to us. And we say with David, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, faith is a gift from God and he gives it to us and he gave it to Joseph in abundance, didn't he? It is God who we serve. It is God that we look to. Let's sing our final hymn, which is about the faithfulness of God. It's on our sheet. It'll be played over the speakers. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. And particularly the chorus, what a faithful God have I. What a faithful God. Let's stand and sing this hymn. <coughs>
Great God, we thank you that you are indeed a faithful God. Thank you that you are faithful in every way. Oh Lord, we do pray that we would truly, truly avail ourselves, as it were, of that faithfulness. Oh Lord, we pray that we would put up that white flag of surrender to you and truly love the Lord Jesus and trust in him. Be with us, O oh Lord, whatever our lives have in store, whatever you have in store for us in the ups and the downs, we pray that we would still be singing even in the storm. What a faithful God have I. Dismiss us with your presence now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.